Oklahoma is the land of second chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll dig for the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute is proud to present Oklahoma Gold. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert, along with award-winning author and Southern Nazarene University historian, John J. Dwyer. We'll find the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now, Oklahoma Gold. He was a founding father of Oklahoma. John J. Dwyer, tell me his story. How many of us have heard the name Pushmataha? Now, maybe some of us know there is a county in Oklahoma named Pushmataha. Some of us may be from that. Uh, but there's actually a, a, a larger than life truly, and I, I speak those words um, meaningfully, that whose name that county, uh, who was the namesake of that county. Uh, Pushmataha was a, Ch- a member of the Choctaw Nation, born in 1764, uh, when the Choctaw domain uh, was in Mississippi and Alabama. He was truly a founding father of Oklahoma, and in a way, I've also called him the Choctaw Moses because he led his people uh, to another land, to, to what they had hoped at the time would be a promised land, and, and in many ways I think has become a promised land for the Choctaws. We look at their accomplishments through Oklahoma history. But he himself was not able to enter that, that land, even though he was their great leader. So who was Pushmataha? He was a, uh, a man, a young man that uh, demonstrated his leadership uh, intellect and warrior skills in an early age in in fighting against numerous other tribes. Uh, as I think folks that have read our book, The Oklahomans, know by now, uh, long before American settlers uh, got here, <laughs> uh, the, the uh, native tribes were fighting each other for land and for power and for, for uh, food sustenance. Uh, Pushmataha, by the time of uh, American independence and moving into the War of 1812, which was when America had to fight for our independence a second time against Britain, uh, Pushmataha at that point was uh, was nearly 50 years old, and he was the leader of the Choctaw Nation. And another probably much more famous person, a leader of the Shawnees and a confederation that he himself had put together, uh, the great Tecumseh came south into the Choctaw domain. And before a gathered host of close to 10,000 Chickasaw and Choctaw uh, members in 1811, Tecumseh came before them and uh, made his pitch for the Choctaws and the Chickasaws uh, to come together with uh, the Shawnees and this confederation that they had put together to oppose America, to side with Britain, and to to literally throw the American people uh, off the continent of North America and back into um, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So what did Tecumseh say? Well, there were numerous scribes, including uh, members of the United States military and diplomats, that were a witness to this. Talk about a uh, a gathering of uh, eagles, uh, a meeting of giants. And this is what Tecumseh said uh, as he made his pitch. So Tecumseh comes with the gathered hosts of his own Shawnee and numerous other tribes, representatives that were allying with him as part of a northern native confederation that was allied with Britain, who was attempting to uh, throw the American people off the North American continent and back into the Atlantic Ocean so that Britain could regain control. And what he wanted to do was recruit what was known to be the powerful tribe, tribes of the Choctaws and the Chickasaws, the southern tribes uh, spread through Mississippi, Alabama, uh, in the deep south in the year of 1811. He comes before a host of probably 10,000 or more people, including the United States military and government officials who recorded uh, these speeches, and Tecumseh says this to the gathered Chickasaws and Choctaws, where today are the Pequot, where are the Narragansett, the Mohican, the Poconet, and other powerful tribes of our people? They have vanished before the avarice and oppression of the white man. Sleep not longer, 
O Choctaws and Chickasaws, will not the bones of our dead be plowed up and their graves turned into plowed fields? That's the end of Tecumseh's quote. So this was not only a, a powerful leader and warrior, but he was a an orator of great... Those are Tecumseh's words? Yeah, as recorded oh my on goodness. the field there in 1811. How eloquent. Yeah. So... Now, Tecumseh, perhaps, is more to us than just the name of a town a little bit east of Norman or name of a road in, in Norman and some other places. And again, these people on that day, Tecumseh and Pushmataha, two giants of Native and American history, were confronting one another. But, and I think this is one of the keys to understanding history three-dimensionally and not just the soundbite version of putting everyone into a slot of either good or evil. They both were doing what they thought was best for their people and their destiny and their future. Tecumseh thought it was with the British. And you're getting ready to hear what Pushmataha thought for. After all the speeches had been made, and Pushmataha, the great chief of the Choctaws, uh, allowed Tecumseh to have his say. And in fact, Apparently, Tecumseh had brought both the Chickasaws and the Choctaws to the brink of allying with him against the Americans on the side of the British. When all got quiet, Pushmataha's voice thundered with the power and consequence of history. These white Americans, he said, and I'm quoting now, Pushmataha, give us fair exchange. Their cloth, their guns, their tools, implements, and other things with the, which the Choctaws need but do not make. So in marked contrast with the experience of the Shawnee, it will be seen that the whites and Indians in this section are living on friendly and mutual, mutually beneficial terms. He then turned his words and his eyes directly on Tecumseh. And I quote from Pushmataha again here, You are a monarch, an unyielding tyrant within your own domain. The Choctaws and Chickasaws have no monarchs. Their chieftains are the people's servants. The majority has spoken on this question, and it has spoken against your contention. You have elected to fight with the British. The Americans have been our friends, and we shall stand by them. That's the end of the quote. And now P Pushmataha warned Tecumseh to his face that he had until the end of the day to be off Choctaw ground, or Pushmataha and his men would come after him. U.S. Army General Sam Dale, the famous a uh, white Indian fighter heard Pushmataha's words to Tecumseh and declared him the greatest orator he'd ever heard. When our fathers took the hand of George Washington, Pushmataha said, they told him the Choctaws could always be the friends of, the, of his nation, and Pushmataha cannot be false to their promises. I am now ready to fight against both the English and the Creeks. Pushmataha is Oklahoma gold. More with the Golden Nugget. His name is more than just a county name, and his leadership is significant to Oklahoma history. Pushmataha is Oklahoma gold. John J. Dwyer, Tell us more. Well, we talked before the break, Gwen, about a remarkable confrontation in 1811 on the eve of the War of 1812. The confrontation between Pushmataha, the mighty leader of the Choctaws uh, uh, of that generation, uh, uh, and Tecumseh, the legendary leader of the Shawnees, who had put together a confederation of northern uh, native tribes to ally with the British and fight against America and try to rid the North American continent of uh, American settlement. Well, that war proceeded, and Pushmataha was greatly involved. He and Andrew Jackson, the famous general and uh, uh, probably most famous and successful general of that generation and certainly of that war for America and, and later two-term president of the United States, uh, Pushmataha and Andrew Jackson became friends and close allies, and they combined to win uh, le hugely crucial southern uh, battles in that war, uh, such as Horseshoe Bend 
and of course uh, the the legendary Battle of New Orleans that was the final battle in 1815 of the War of 1812. Pushmataha and his Choctaws helped Andrew Jackson and the American uh, soldiers win both of those battles. I don't remember learning that in Oklahoma history in school. I, maybe I wasn't paying attention, but it's so. Well, afterwards, though, in the in the ensuing years, as American settlement with the British, you know, finally the Americans ridded of the British menace, finally the unfair treatment and the oppression, and American settlement uh, just tided westward, and now we're talking the 1820s and forward. Well, Pushmataha made it uh, his uh, prime focus and concern. Wise man and visionary that he was, he recognized with the millions and millions of immigrants tiding a tidal wave into America from Europe and elsewhere, the Choctaws had, and they were maybe the largest tribe on the North American continent at that point with 22,000 people. He knew the writing was on the wall for eventual movement west for them to have autonomy and, and, and to succeed and, and prosper and even survive. So he worked hard. He came and hunted uh, modern-day Oklahoma lands, and that may be one reason why the Choctaws wound up with a beautiful southeast Choctaw country, the Kaimichi Mountains and others. Uh, but it came time in the 1820s to sign a treaty that would uh, assure the Choctaws peaceful western migration uh, when the time came. And uh, it went back and forth, and there were differences between the United States government's position and, and Pushmataha and the Choctaws. And so eventually Pushmataha met with Andrew Jackson, uh, who was still a general, the most powerful general in the American Army at that point. This was in 1820, uh, working on the Treaty of Doak's Stand. It's famous in Oklahoma history. And uh, General Jackson was just done with Pushmataha's, as Jackson would look at it, just his stubbornness on getting this treaty signed. And he addressed the chief. And again, this is recorded by United States military secretaries. He says to Pushmataha, General Andrew Jackson, I wish you to understand that I am Andrew Jackson, and by the eternal, you shall sign that treaty as I have prepared it. Well, the mighty Choctaw chief, perhaps to Jackson's surprise, and I said a moment ago, Pushmataha was an equal opportunity offender, whether it was Tecumseh or Andrew Jackson, he was not in the least intimidated by this haughty address, and he sprang suddenly to his feet, his warrior's feet, in imitating the manner of Andrew Jackson, declared, I know very well who you are, but I wish you to understand that I am Pushmataha, head chief of the Choctaws, and by the eternal, I will not sign that treaty. And so, the Treaty of Doak Stan, which stipulated that voluntary migration west by the Choctaws, was not signed until Andrew Jackson adjusted its provisions to require removal of the white squatters from the land to which the great tribe was moving. And there were a series of, of acts during that period. Uh, some of, of my fellow Oklahoma history buffs may know that uh, Arkansas Territory originally included modern-day Oklahoma, and the way it was divided was white settlers were to stay in modern-day Arkansas, and then the tribes were to have the domain that's now Oklahoma. Well, white Settlers were encroaching early day boomers, you might call it, and uh, uh, Pushmataha demanded that uh, Andrew Jackson get those squatters out of there, and he did. Well, later in 1824, and I call this final the final gun. Uh, Pushmataha headed another Choctaw delegation to Washington D.C. to protest some renewed encroachments, and he 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 came down ill, and it became clear. Uh, that he was going to die and not even be able to leave Washington. And he said, I came here when a young man to see my father, Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson. He told me if we ever got in trouble, we must run and tell him. I have come. I can boast and say and tell the truth that none of my fathers or grandfathers nor any Choctaw ever drew his bow against the United States. They've always been friendly. We've held the hand of the United States so long that our nails are long like bird's claws and there is no danger of their slipping out. And he requested only that he be buried with military honors and have a big gun fired over his grave. And indeed, that's what happened when he was buried with full military honors in a procession over a mile long of his funeral right down Pennsylvania Avenue. 
in Washington, D.C. with Andrew Jackson in the entourage. In 1824. Now that's Oklahoma gold. <laughs> 